just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to Science on Top. This is episode 354 for Sunday, the 22nd of March, 2020. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. And planetary scientist and popular children's book author, Dr. Helen Maynard Casely. Welcome back. Hello. Popular children's book author, tell us all about I Heart Pluto. It's got quite a cute story. It's it's actually aimed for sort of five to six year olds and probably a bit lower um so it's i've co-authored it with chris ferry who um who is a, a theoretical physicist based at university of technology sydney but he's probably most known to a lot of people for writing all of the quantum physics for babies um there's a whole sort of series of books that he calls baby university so he wrote um a book him and lizzie wrote a book called um eight little planets and it's it's also a really gorgeous little book. And at the end, all the planets have a party. And I bought it for a friend. And I sort of, because I know Chris a bit, I tweeted at him, Chris, um, this is a beautiful book, but we need to talk about Pluto. And he sort of came back and went, hey, well, why don't we write a book about Pluto? And it answers that question, which I'm sure everybody still is still a bit confused about, of why is Pluto not a planet? Why is Pluto not a planet? Because because the because um, we got to the point where um, the astronomers were getting a bit too good at finding um, smaller planets, um, and it got to a bit. It was getting a bit ridiculous that if Pluto was a planet, it meant that Eris had to be a planet, Panama had to be a planet, and probably Ceres, which is one of the asteroids as well. So um, it's not so much that it's not a planet; it's more that it's it's the start of a new class of planet, the dwarf planets. And kind of the cute thing about the book is that you know how we can, you can, you know, draw. if I asked you to draw Jupiter, you would draw like a, an orange blob and you'd give it a red spot, right? And everybody would know that's Jupiter. The, one of the ideas that we worked really hard with the illustrator Lizzie, who's done, Lizzie Doyle, who's done an amazing job on this, is that we wanted to make the dwarf planets recognisable. So there's a few like little things. So Ceres has its bright spot, which I know um, you've talked about on the podcast before. And Sharon's got its little cap of methane. And so there's a few things that sort of hopefully make each of the dwarf planets their own distinguishing feature as well. Very, very cool. So definitely one to check out if you have little kids or even if you just like cute drawings of planets. Well, I hope it sells well because it looks really, really good. Uh, And I think that's a great effort. We need to get science to the young as early as we can and get them brought up with a love of astronomy and science and all good things. So well done on that. Oh, thank you very much. So let's move on to the show. But just before we do, I want to remind everyone that the reason we can do this show at all is because of the generous donations from our Patreon supporters. All you have to do is go to scienceontop.com slash donate where you can sign up and donate a few dollars an episode or more or less, as much as you'd like. You'll only get charged when we release an episode, so you can put a limit on how much you donate per month. It really helps us just keep the website going and the recording software licensed and all of those sort of overheads. So thank you everyone who has done that. Now, Helen, let's move on and talk about Mars and the InSight lander, which has had problems that we've talked about on the show before where it just can't drill down deep like it's supposed to but that may have fixed that how have they fixed it uh they fixed it in the best experimental approach ever they've smacked it with a shovel (laughs) which um i have never done to my instrument at all ever um (laughs) one does not smack um anything with shovels but it's it it is quite wonderful actually um I did a lot of undergraduate geophysics and I basically had to do something very similar to the InSight mission where I had to dig and bury a um, seismometer into the ground. And there the approach was you shove it down with a, with a, with a um, shovel. So, yeah, so um, it's probably not an approach they hope to make. I think 
generally the um, soil or the bedrock, well, it's not really bedrock, the sort of the compacted soil underneath where Insight has landed has been a lot tougher than they than they anticipated. But um, it's really good that they had sort of the means to sort of give it a bit of a walk. Um, but the upshot of the fact that this um, soil is more compacted is it means that Insight's already been pretty successful at detecting um, Mars quakes, which is the whole reason that it was sent there in the first place. I think it's actually, for me, it's probably the most exciting Mars mission going on at the moment um, because it's going to literally sit there on the surface and look for wobbles of the uh, ground. And um, Well done. <laughs> you got wobble into it again. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And with those wobbles, it should be able to work out what the interior structure of Mars is. And that for me is amazing because we have all of these amazing minerals that we know are probably down there. Um, and it means that we can go back and do much better experiments on them. So I can start doing some more high pressure experiments on Martian minerals um, going forwards. And, and we can just generally understand because one of the weird things about Mars is that it... It doesn't have a magnetic field, and as a result, we think that this is why it maybe has lost its atmosphere. So if we can sort of understand what's happened in the interior, why, you know, it seems a lot like Earth on the surface, apart from being a bit smaller. Why doesn't it have this magnetic field? Is that something going on in its interior? And then we can um, move forward from that. I just, the thing that strikes me about this whole, oh, we decided to hit it with the shovel thing, is why did it take so long to try that? I mean, this has been going on, I think, close to a year since it landed that they've been trying to drill down. And, I mean, they, they, were, they made some progress and then it got stuck again and they had to uh, try again and again. At some point, they've just realised, hey, we also have a shovel attached to it. Why don't we give it a good whack? <laughs> it... Um, well, the reason behind it is like, okay, so they, they spent a lot of time and effort getting this thing to Mars um, um, it was I, I know I personally I know a few people who were involved in it and it was already delayed and they missed their first launch window and things so if you're going to do anything um, remotely to a spacecraft that you've spent billions and no in this case it's actually more millions sorry and um, and also m much of time and effort has gone into it you're going to test everything you do before you do it and so that's probably what in fact that's not probably i know that's what they've been doing in the mars yard at jpl is they've been testing how do we um how do we shove it how do we bang it with the shovel and get it working and and there's a nice little video of, of them actually doing it in situ but that would have been uh, procedures built up and risk analysis done on every little movement can they get the, the movement fast enough to do it? And all sorts of things. So they would have planned that movement absolutely meticulously. Um, very differently to me on a field in Italy, just shoving it with a, with a banner a long time ago. I also read that it was very much uh, the plan C because they, they remember they, and we talked about it on the show already too, they, they did already try kind of pushing the ground next to where the mole had gone down to, to try and give it more purchase so that there was a bit more friction and that they were most concerned about about because where the where the mole uh, the mole has got the you know the the data line and the um, uh, it's it's basically it, think of it like an extension cord coming up out of the hole that it makes and they were most concerned about breaking that if they were to hit it from above. So the shovel, the shovel action was kind of proposed a while ago, but it was case of, okay, this is very much the last resort if we can't do anything else because of the risk. Um, so, and then they also pointed out in one of the stories that they had, um, as, as Helen was saying, they 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 had practiced so much to do this that their skills had had greatly increased in terms of controlling the the scoop the shovel so when when it was originally proposed as an op, as an option it was pretty much discounted because they simply didn't feel that they had enough control over it but you know in the in the you know in the months that have gone by since then they've they've got so much better at it that they were able to say with a lot more confidence you know exactly how they would control it and it would end up exactly where they wanted it to so 
so yeah, it was it was uh, I, I I kind of liken it to when, when you're when you're remote controlling anything, particularly things like that fly, if you've ever flown helicopters or drones or anything like that sort of stuff with a remote control, when you first get them, you think to yourself, I'm never going to be able to do this. This is just ridiculously hard. But then, you know, the more you do it, the the easier it becomes, and that becomes very much second nature. Imagine doing that, you know, but what you're controlling is on another planet. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I think I think it's got a bit longer as well because Mars is, is as far, almost as far from us as it can be, and that's one of the reasons that Mars launch window is coming up for the next one. Ah, uh, okay, that makes sense. But I mean, I, I've been uber impressed with Insight. I mean, it's the, as I said, it's the one I was most looking forward to. There's been a number of things. It's obviously detected um, Mars quakes. It should be able to detect meteorites hitting in the local area. Um, but then the other really cool thing is it was involved in the first interplanetary CubeSat mission, the the Marco cubes, um, who were cutely called Wally and Eve. Um, their mission literally only ended like three weeks ago. And they were all about, they were the very first ones to go there and to relay the, the basically they were integral into the landing of InSight. And so for me, that's a really exciting thing that now we have, or at least one interplanetary CubeSat mission. That means that basically, you know, it's a matter of launching it, but CubeSats are something that a university group can can afford, right? So we're getting to that point where we can all bolt on our own, own instruments and send them off and look for data. So um, there's been a lot of really cool milestones from this mission and uh, hopefully more to come. And while we're talking about Mars and things to come, uh, we could just mention, I guess, that there's a new nickname for the Mars 2020 rover, isn't there? What's that, Helen? <laughs> Very 2020, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, it's pro- I think it's it's been delayed, hasn't it? So it's more Mars 2021, <laughs> 2022, I think. Uh, no, it's it's on schedule. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's on schedule. They're just like, oh, yeah, we're just like, oh, we'll launch it in 2020. But yeah. <laughs> yes, it will land. Hopefully, well, hopefully it will launch in July. Um, and as I say, it's called Perseverance or Percy. <laughs> Percy, I hadn't called it. I hadn't heard it abbreviated. But, uh... Yeah, yeah. All the JPL engineers are calling it Percy, which I think is really cute. Called that is. Perseverance. Uh, sorry, the Mars mission that's been delayed. I uh, was wrong. It's the um, Exo Mars, the ESA Russian joint mission. Yes, that, that one was going to be called Rosalind Franklin, that rover, sorry. She is going to be called Rosalind Franklin, which unfortunately I think means everyone's going to call it Rosie, which is cool, but at the same time, that's one thing that Rosalind Franklin really hated. She hated the <laughs> Rosie. <laughs> well, call it Frankie then. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's been postponed because the uh, coronavirus pandemic and some technical issues as well, so... That's a shame, but we will uh, keep an eye on it and see what happens. And as we are well aware, space missions get delayed all the time. (laughs) Now, Lucas, let's move on and talk about glass. It's everywhere in our lives. It's on our phones. It's in our windows, in our mirrors. But if you'd asked me what the ideal glass is, I would have said it's the one that's full of wine. What are we actually talking about here, though? Ideal glass. Maybe we should just stop there. That's actually that's a good proposal. <laughs> stop the podcast. Go and drink wine, everybody. <laughs> Literally stop there. Stop the podcast. Go and drink wine. I'm okay. <laughs> so I, I didn't know that there was much of a mystery about glass. I have heard... In the past, and I don't know whether this is correct or not, but I had heard in the past that glass has a strange property in that it's still basically flowing, like its structure is the same as a liquid, but it's 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 basically not moving. But there are, and I think we may have even reported on this before, there are glass windows that were made in like the Middle Ages or something or other that that are that have continued to flow, albeit extremely slowly. So they do change structure over a, a really long period of time. And I thought that was to do with how they were uh, assembled, and it was to you know there was a little squire who was up on top of the ladder doing it and getting burnt and everything, and it just the way it was 
created before it had solidified that they were thicker down the bottom. But maybe we're wrong. I thought that was a myth, like the medieval church windows. Because I know, I know about that pitch drop experiment, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm here to learn. I'm doing solids, liquids and gases at the moment with Year 7. I need to know these things. <laughs> oh, oh. They, yeah, they, it's not that they change structure so much. It's more that they, they are still able to flow um, because they've got, as you say, it's exactly what you say. They're essentially a, a slowed down liquid. Glass. So there is this, um, I'm not a grass expert. I'm, you know, I, as, as I was saying earlier, it's I only like my atoms in a nice regular order. And the problem with um, glass and the reason why it's so mysterious is it's really hard to study because fundamentally the, the, the atoms are not in a regular order. So when we talk about um, Ed's favourite glass, which is wine glasses, that's silicon oxide. So that's the same thing as quartz. It's just we're, the way we make it makes it into a vitreous glass and so we can see through it and it has all these great properties of, of, of being like not conducting heat very well and things like that all to do with the fact that the atom's not particularly well arranged. That's awesome background on, on uh, ex- exactly exactly what this story is about. So I did not know that one of the, the big mysteries of glass is uh, it relates to the, the structure of the molecules in whatever it is that's set. So if you, you've got two, basically two states of solid matter that you're going to end up with with most materials. You're going to end up with a crystalline structure where all of the uh, the, the atoms are very orderly in, in their arrangement. So typically, and, and Helen mentioned before, you can even get water to form a non-crystalline structure. Typically, water, for example, will will form when it when it forms ice, it will it will form a crystalline structure. So it, it falls into a very um, orderly sort of pattern, um, and and you know you can see this occurring when when you're when uh, if you look at water um, under a microscope, uh, or even you know at a, at a at a more macro level, you can you can still see this happening with the crystalline structures forming right in front of your eyes as as it's going you know, it's undergoing that transition from liquid into into a solid, which is really cool by the way. It's a very cool thing to watch um, when. It comes to glass, though. So silica, of course, is the most common uh, thing that we we you know have used in order to make windows and other glass that we we think of. The thing with silica is that when it makes that transition from liquid as it cools into a solid, unlike crystalline structures where the all of those atoms form a very orderly pattern, the the Atoms within the silica don't. They basically stay very haphazard and very random and a bit of a mess. So um, it's as though they just, it's a liquid. It's really more like a liquid because you've got this really disordered structure, but it just stops flowing when it makes that transition. So over thousands of years, as glass blowers have perfected their, their technique, they have learned that the way that you cool glass will have quite an impact on the structure that you end up with. And in fact, if you cool it much more slowly, then the glass ends up with a much denser packed material, almost as though if you imagine pouring sand into a container full of pebbles and all of the sand you know, bits are falling, all the, all the little um, pieces of sand are falling in between the pebbles. Over time, they'll fill up more and more of those gaps in between the pe- pebbles than if you just dump the sand in there and go, okay, everything freeze. So the challenge is you want it to cool down and form its glass structure slowly enough that the all of those molecules have got enough time to settle effectively into their most dense format. Um, so one of the big mysteries about glass apparently and where this ideal glass comes into play is in order for that to occur apparently there hasn't really been enough time in the universe yet (laughs) (laughs) that's what this work is about they're sort of looking at the really sort of big scale properties of glass um as i say the difficulty is it's just really hard to study because you know the atoms are sort of not in a particularly great arrangement so how do you describe them the way that we usually describe them is you do a sort of 
statistical analysis, you sort of say, right, well, I'm going to pick one atom, I'm going to say you're the middle atom, and then we're going to say on average at this distance there are three others, and then at this distance there's four or five others. And that's how people build up um, glass models and things. Yeah, so there's a theoretical state of, of, of glass, which is this ideal glass that's that's been – cooled over such a long period of time and it's been given such a long period of time for its atoms to to arrange themselves in the densest possible way that they're very 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 stable um but the the challenge is that what what's being described is much more like a crystalline structure but it isn't um so what was interesting about this story is that a um physicist miguel uh, ramos um was uh, he found out he 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 I think he's based in Madrid. He found out that a team of um, uh, of scientists uh, had uh, paleontologists had found some liquid amber that was really really old uh, that had insects in it or, or something like that. I can't remember the specifics of it. Um, and so he was contacted by these paleontologists who who knew that he was very interested in ancient. Um, uh, amber, because amber obviously formed a long, long time ago. We have amber from, you know, the, the various periods of the dinosaurs and so forth. So he was interested in the amber in its purest, clearest forms. Um, so he he was contacted by these people who knew about this, and and they offered him some samples that didn't contain anything of interest to the paleontologists, i.e., no insects or anything like that. Um, and he he got these pieces of amber to then study them. Now, it seems that the uh, the study is ongoing and he has not yet published this as far as I can tell. The cool thing that he did, though, and, and the thing that's the thing that's under review, is that he took it, took this sample, this pure sort of very old amber, to as close to absolute zero as he possibly could. So he put it in a dilution fridge and went down to like midi Kelvin. And I think that the idea that with that is to he wanted to remove all of the thermal movement of the atoms and really sort of try and say, hey, this is the oldest piece of glass that we know of. And can I deduce from this um, something about the, the potential long term stability or like the ideal relaxed state of the glass? And I think and I don't know whether it was his paper because. Uh, it says towards the end of it that there's paper still under review uh, for publication. So I'm not, I don't know whether it was his paper or another set of uh, scientists that were doing a concurrent study. But um, but I, I found this interesting for multiple reasons. The first of which is I didn't even know that this was a mystery um, and I didn't know that, that, that glass had these characteristics. But also um, I found this a very novel uh, approach to to looking at this particular mystery, looking at glass that effectively was formed by nature so long ago, which which is a, a kind of a left field thing. Which I love these things that come out of left field that are not not necessarily obvious. Um, so yeah, I'd love to love to sort of follow this and see where it goes. But uh, it, it as I say, quite a novel approach to a problem that I didn't know existed. So I'm still not sure on the whole amber thing. So are they saying amber is essentially a, a natural form of glass or something? Is that what that was about? Well, it's the way that it forms is 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 very similar, um, and because of the time frame that's involved, because this is so so old, we don't have any any uh, silicas that, as old that we can use. You know, silica glass is old that we can um, look at that time frame that's been in, involved with it. Sorry, my geologist hat on me. Sorry, I'm sorry I didn't come to the story earlier. So I'm a little bit confused about that because there is a lot of obsidian glass around. And admittedly, it doesn't, which is silica dioxide glass that's thrown out by volcanoes. So, yeah, and I'm intrigued as to why they studied, and that's not really addressed here, why they studied amber, which, you know, amber is going to be full of long chain, sticky molecules that wouldn't really like I, I can see why they sort of think that it might have settled into its glassiest state but yeah I'm, I'm intrigued by this I, I like what well, Lucas I'm gonna go read up about it 
more. He doesn't obsidian cool extremely quickly. I wondered. And that's why, because... Yes, I wondered whether that came down to just how rapidly obsidian is formed. Yeah. But yeah, and but that's the same as silicon oxide. It, it's it's the same material. It's essentially it just that it cools so quickly, the atoms can't arrange themselves into um, into something crystalline, and they just go. Ah, I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to sit here. So maybe amber forms more slowly, but still is glass-like. I, yeah. So the the, the bit. Um... The bit that seems relevant about the amber, and I'm just going to read a part from this particular story. It says, so, so, but then there's the amber. Ramos and his collaborators published the, the comparisons of old and rejuvenated samples of the yellow glass in physical review letters in 2014. They found that the 110 million and old, million year old amber had grown about 2% denser in line with ultra stable glass. This would suggest that the amber had indeed stabilised over time as little groups of molecules slipped one by one into lower energy arrangements. So it, it, it seemed to be the fact that it continued to stabilise over time and maybe that's what's different about it compared to mm. things like obsidian, for example. Yeah, and I think that's exactly, that's, um, and I think that's because the, the molecules involved are not just silica units they're bigger units and they yeah that you can take a bit more time over that but getting back to the stained glass mirrors and uh, windows sorry and uh, the medieval windows uh, i've just found an article on scientific american that sort of looking at the fact or fiction of that um, glass does flow as you say but it doesn't flow fast enough for those windows to have flowed down and swelled at the bottom and that is mostly an artifact of how they're created uh, when they're first assembled well, the takeaway for me is still glass is weird and there's a lot that we don't understand about it. <laughs> I think that in itself is a worthy takeaway. <laughs> okay, well, Penny, let's uh, talk about our ancestors, which 450 million years ago crawled out of the ocean and then grew limbs and walked around. What can we learn from those fins and how they formed into fingers, I guess? Yeah, so our ancestors a long, long, long time ago were fish, basically, and eventually some of these fish, their fins kind of evolved into the limbs of the tetrapods. And if you look at the arrangement of bones in a human arm or a horse's leg or a bird's wing or a bat's wing, it's the same, basically. Like the bones are different lengths and widths. Sometimes some might be missing or fused but you can really see the pattern. And so what we're looking at here is one of those, um, not a missing link, but a stage along that pathway from something that you're like, yes, that is flat out a fish to something that you're like, that's a reptile, a bird, a mammal, an amphibian. So this fish is part of a genus of fish called L. Pistostegi. <laughs> and um, so this one lived about 380 million years ago, belonging to a group called Elpistostegalians. So, yes. So you get used to saying these words, but I'm not used to saying that one. And I think we've talked about a more ancient sort of ancestor called Tiktaalik, if you remember that one from ages ago. What's different about this new find is that all of the bones in its pectoral fin are really well preserved. So it's, it's the same thing. It's got um, it's one of those sort of lobe-finned fish with a sort of a, a strengthened pectoral fin. But what we see in these bones, which are quite delicate, is the same kind of arrangement of bones as in... A tetrapod hand or arm so to speak so this was being shown by a um, ct scan of the fin bones found in the fossil so they've got basically a, a bone that is identifiable as a humerus a radius an ulna and all the little bones of the hand it's really interesting to me because what good does all that do in a fin and maybe it's because they were moving 
on to land or they sometimes went on to land or I have no idea um, and it helped them bear their weight a bit more effectively than the sort of the rays of fins. Um, perhaps it helped increase like the surface area that was supported by bone. For whatever reason, it didn't evolve so that one day we could get, you know, a horse's, a horse's leg and a bird's wing and a human's hand with an opposable thumb and then we could invent mobile phones. But, it's, but it is so easy to look at the outcomes and go, oh, well, of course. But you've got to kind of think, well, what was that doing for that organism at that time? And even though we know how it changed later, it's really interesting. So this one, it really kind of is starting to blur the line between a fish and a tetrapod or a vertebrate that is capable of living on land. And it's kind of fascinating. So this, this CT scan helps us understand our evolutionary ancestry. It's another plot in that story. And it's just really nicely preserved. So unlike that tiktalic one, which was missing the extreme end of its fin, it's got those really interesting little radial bones at the end so that we can see them. The thing I really love about evolutionary biology is just trying to figure out how different things would evolve. Like, And, and this is a perfect example. I can sort of see how an entire bony fin might evolve, but to have tiny little bones in that fin that could move around, really bizarre. Very cool. I love looking at phylo phylogenies, especially like the ones that are kind of for kids or lay people that have pictures because I'm not a specialist in this at all. And they'll have all these different kinds of fish and you're like, wow, the fish are actually more diverse than all the tetrapods. I never realised that. Like you are more like a turtle than one kind of fish is like another kind of fish. That blows my mind. Well, while we're talking about... Um aquatic animals that also move on land it's good uh, time to move on to the frogs and i didn't realize that australia has loads of frogs in the desert because you wouldn't think that that they love the water so much but this is a time where a lot of frogs are waking up after some recent rains aren't they yeah so apparently there was um some pretty significant r rain um in early march and this is in the sturt national park in northwest new south wales and hundreds of frogs started to emerge from the sand. So there's this variety of species of desert frogs. Apparently they can live, they have a lifespan of up to 20 years, but they spend most of that hibernating underground, about a metre underground, wrapped up in layers of kind of water-saving cocoon, which is amazing. So... Um, when it rains, the sound of the rain falling is the trigger for them to come up and they've just got to really quickly get up to the top, mate, grow the new babies, maybe even they can mate again and then get back down before everything dries up again because frogs being amphibians, they need water for their young to develop. So, yeah, so because tadpoles, like, I mean, in a way we all de all tetrapods still develop in water like it's either in a uterus or in an amniotic sac or the liquid of an egg um, but frogs need that to be in actual water too so obviously the desert is not known for its abundance of water but after rain which could be only three or four times in their 20 year life is their chance for going up being an you know finding a mate having their babies, the babies grow up big enough to be able to burrow themselves. So it's um, they're very quick to develop these kinds of frogs. And the ecologists made the point, it's actually kind of exciting for someone who is a desert ecologist to say that they're going out frogging. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not a common thing. Because I know a few people who work as park rangers, like, oh, yeah, I went frogging, blah, blah, blah. Frogging sounds like something very different. It just means looking for frogs, people. There's no, like, subtext. Yeah, ob obviously. That's all I thought it meant, yeah. Or playing frogger, yeah. Because you're so pure, Ed. <laughs> well, I am, I am seeing this story as something of a metaphor as we're all going into quarantine and lockdown that we're basically hibernating at home. And then when 
when the, the quarantine is lifted, we'll all go out and mate. But no, very cool story. It is always good that we have the rain that uh, this sort of environment needs and this ecology is built around. And just the, uh, the adaptations that the natural world comes up with to deal with extremes. Okay, that is our show. And as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 354. Helen, where do people go to pre-order I Heart Pluto? Pre-ordering, um, it's available from um, April, hopefully, from all um, good bookshops, booktopia.com.au, all the ones online as well. And thank you very much for joining us on Science on Top today. It's uh, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. And thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. What happened to an astrophysicist in Australia when he tried to invent a device that warned a person when they were about to touch their face? Yeah, Helen. He put some magnets up his nose and they stuck together. And then he had a brilliant idea, which was he put more magnets up his nose, but they stuck to the original magnets. And then he tried to put a pair of pliers up his nose, but the pliers magnetized and nearly took his nose off. And then, quote, he went to his girlfriend who said, all my mates at A&E would really like to laugh at you. And that's how he went to hospital. Exactly that. Yeah. This is Dr. Daniel Riordan. Here he is. I mean, I hope this photo was taken after the magnets were removed, but I think his partner probably had quite a lot of fun taking the photo of him because he does, in fact, look quite sad and ashamed. Yes, absolutely. This is actually a still from a remake of a 1980s film called Nasal Attraction. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's a blessing that he only shoved them up his nose. <laughs>